two or more sheep following him together comprise a flock. If, we were, if the analogy was rhinoceroses, thank God Jesus didn't say, I'm the good rhinoceros herder, right? Some would fit the bill of rhinoceros. We'd be a crash. That's what a group of rhinoceroses are called. A crash, but we are a flock. Two or more sheep falling in together comprise a flock. And we will follow Jesus down a simple path through the New Testament and trust him to guide us. He has authority everywhere. And he's here present this morning. And he wants to instruct and guide gently Emmanuel Baptist Church. This is the chief shepherd's path to appoint pastors in every church. So let's start in Matthew 4. In verse 17, Jesus of Nazareth preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15 tells us that Jesus preached, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And many people that heard Jesus repented and believed the gospel. Jesus' first disciples were among those people. Matthew recorded for us, Jesus' calling of those first disciples, which Richard read earlier for us, when Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And Jesus beckoned, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He invited them to follow him, and he promised to make them into something. See, they were fishermen. They were accustomed to casting nets into the sea so they could haul in fish to the market. Jesus called them to follow him so he could make them fishers of men. He would teach them to cast the net of the gospel into the nations and haul in people to the kingdom of God. And then shepherd those people, if we can go from a fish analogy to a flock analogy, shepherd those people once they're a part of the kingdom. So their journey to fish for men would begin if they simply took the first step when Jesus said, what? Follow me. They took that first step and then they took the next step and then they took the next step. And I believe it's in the gospel of Luke where Jesus said that when he appointed the 12 that they were with him. They were with him. They were together with him. Step by step, walking with Jesus through Israel, spending personal time with the Son of God. They forsook everything, their careers, their families, everything to follow Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not advocating this morning that to follow Jesus, you've got to leave your family. Okay? There is such a thing that you, if you miss Sunday school, you miss us talking about progressive revelation. Jesus had something specific he wanted to say and, and do through these men in this time. And they, they were willing to forsake everything. Okay? To follow Jesus. Later on, after a night of prayer on a mountain, Jesus selected eight more men to be with him. And he called these 12 men his apostles or his sent ones. And they would eventually represent him and his message to the Jews and the nations. And as they would witness of him in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, people would repent. And believe the gospel. Where people are called to repent and believe the gospel, guess what happens? People do that. The gospel can't go to a wrong address. And wherever the gospel goes, somebody's going to respond to it. Someone with the right heart soil will respond to that message. People would repent, believe the gospel. They'd be baptized. They would learn to obey Jesus alongside other disciples. In assemblies of people called churches. Yes, a man speaks of true born again believers, all true born again believers in the world as Christ's church. And the New Testament shows us that Christ built his church in Jerusalem. We're going to see how he did it. But by the end of the New Testament, you find churches in cities and in towns and in villages all over the world. Someone has suggested that saying local church is like saying wet water. The church of the living God cannot help but be local. And here's a definition for you if you're taking notes in the back of your bulletin. A church is a local, visible assembly 
of born again, baptized believers in our Lord Jesus Christ that obeys the commands of King Jesus. A church is a local visibly, visible assembly of born again. That means someone who has believed the gospel been regenerated. A baby cannot believe of their own accord, can they? So churches that are comprised of a bunch of people who are baptized as infants are those biblical churches if those people were not born again. Food for thought. It is a local, it is a visible assembly of born again, baptized believers in our Lord Jesus Christ that obeys the commands of King Jesus. And the New Testament records such local visible assemblies all over the world. I have them listed with Bible references for you. We're not going to all these references, but I will, I'm going to just go through this list. You can, I would encourage you to further check this out for yourself and see what the scriptures teach us about the local church. You have the church of Jerusalem. You have the churches of Judea, which was the region of Jerusalem. And Galilee, which was to the north. And Samaria was sandwiched in between Galilee and Judea. You have the church at Antioch of Syria. That's the church where uh, Gentile believers were. The, it was the first place where a majority of those believers were Gentile believers. That's the church that sent Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey. The churches at Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, and Lystra, and Derbe. Those are the churches that were established by Paul and Barnabas as they preached the gospel and baptized believers and made disciples establish those churches. You have the church at Thessalonica, which started in Acts 16. And it's spoken of in the letter, of course, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. You have the church at Philippi. You have the church at Corinth. The church at Ephesus, the churches on the island of Crete, the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is in modern Turkey, and the church at Ephesus is included in that number. And a couple more that I forgot and failed to put on the list because I'm a human. The churches of Galatia, if you write down Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2, you see Galatia was a region, there were churches in that region. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2. I see everybody's writing that down, so good. Churches of Colossia. And Laodicea, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16, there were churches in Colossae and churches in Laodicea. Or a church in Laodicea, a church in Colossae. You have, of course, the church that was in Rome. Okay? A local visible assembly of born-again baptized believers in Rome existed before the Holy Roman Catholic, which means universal, church. Somebody went off somewhere along the way. So I want to point out something. I would shake hands with a brother who believes in the universal church, the the body of Christ all over the world. And I believe that there is some biblical support for that truth. Christ did affirm, I will build my what? My church. Also, the writer of Hebrews told believers in Hebrews chapter 12, In verses 22 through 24, he said, Ye are come, talking to the believers, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. You're a part of this church written in heaven. I would shake hands with a brother who wants to camp out with the universal church because there is such a thing. There is that truth. And then I would invite him to demonstrate his name is written in heaven as a member of that general assembly and church of the firstborn, by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together here on earth. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And by remembering them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. You can't follow someone's faith if you never see them. If you don't submit To him, per the text, submit to them, those pastors of that congregation, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You can't see what their life is demonstrating as pastors in a local congregation if you have not submitted to the authority of that church and those leaders, Hebrews chapter 13. So the same writer taught Hebrew believers both truths. Believers in Jesus are a part of that collective church, the universal, eternal body of of Christ, made up of all true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But believers in Jesus are also called to assemble with the local body of believers, the local church, and submit 
to the leadership of that church. So it's Bible to say, I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm a member of his heavenly church in Christ. But it's also Bible to submit to his visible local church on earth and be led by his appointed pastors. To covenant with those people to be identified as a member, as a part of that church. So if we're going to understand the chief shepherd's path to appoint pastors in every church, we must understand the authority of the local church. You cannot be a faithful disciple of Jesus apart from joining yourself to a local New Testament church. To be identified as one of them publicly. That happens by baptism, right? When someone first believes. But if someone comes from another church and they've already been born again and baptized in another church, it happens by a state, by a transfer of letter. And a lot of churches have done away with that. But how can we identify a true born again believer who has been baptized according to the Bible, who's obeying Jesus, but by the testimony of the, of another church? To say they're following Jesus. A, a wolf's not showing up with you. And if that's not available, then we accept people upon a statement of faith that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they want to follow him with his people. Maybe they had been baptized previously, but the church where they were discipled and brought up is not in existence anymore or it drifted away from the Lord and they want to say, I want to be a part of a local visible assembly. And so here I am. I want to commit my life to this people to come under the authority of this church and be held accountable by this church. You must submit yourself to the local church's authority. Otherwise, like a fish out of water, you will not make it on your own. And what's, what's just as bad, you will not multiply. And Christ intends for you to multiply as a disciple, but you will not be fruitful if you don't abide in Jesus. And Jesus said, here's my command, love one another. Now tell me how you can do that apart from committing your life to a specific people in a specific place in a specific time and be held accountable to follow Jesus with them. How can you love his disciples apart from that? So that brings us to this. How did Christ build his church? What did he do at the beginning and along the way to establish churches that would help his disciples thrive? How did he prepare the first church's leadership? And did they have one human leader? Did they have many? Did the leader or the leaders have a code of conduct? Was the leader or were the leaders held accountable by a higher human authority? And what is that higher human authority? How did Christ build his church? I want to spend a majority of time to demonstrate, number one, the chief shepherd built his church by teaching and commissioning his apostles. The chief shepherd built his church by teaching and commissioning his apostles. Now remember, he called those first disciples and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the gospel of Matthew records a three and a half year process of them following him and him making them fishers of men. So these men were the first followers of Jesus. These men would be the first leaders of Jesus or, or for Jesus. Is that fair to say? First followers of Jesus, first leaders for Jesus. So how did Jesus disciple his disciples? Should we disciple disciples like Jesus discipled his disciples? Well, that makes sense. How did their discipleship begin? It all started when the Son of God went up into a mountain, Matthew chapter 5. He settled in, he called his disciples to himself, and he taught them, and I'm going to connect this to last week by saying this, he taught them wisdom from above. How does heaven teach me to live? Look at verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which do hunger, or I'm sorry, which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
See, Jesus first assured his disciples with blessing from God. The attitudes that come along with true repentance, right? When you confess your need for the light, you confess your need for Jesus, and you look to the king, true repentance, the attitudes that come along with true repentance are blessed attitudes. The behaviors that develop from the heart of the man or woman who turns from sin and runs to Christ, those are blessed behaviors. People like that, they admit their spiritual bankruptcy and their sinfulness. They're meek, they humbly submit to God. They become come hungry for his righteous ways and they have this new sense of who they are as sinners. Identity check, I'm a sinner. And yet the king, the Messiah, loves me. They have a new sense of mercy toward other sinners because they know how sinful they are and the mercy that Jesus, the king, has given them. And they can begin to discard the dirt and the junk from their hearts so they can purely love God, pure in heart, and obey Jesus. And they willingly learn to make peace with people. Listen, if you have been saved from your sin, you've been saved from yourself. And, oh, I've got to promote self. When you promote self, you take peace. You don't make peace. But when you've been reconciled with God, you are able to be a peacemaker. And they joyfully endure persecution for doing right. The people of this world hate what a person has when they have a right relationship with God. And what is that? Peace. A person of this world's in the darkness. They have no peace. And so oftentimes the response to that darkness is to attack and persecute the light rather than embracing the light. And so those who are of the light, who Jesus said, you're the light of the world, when they're shining the light and they're under attack, if they cower... If they give up their joy that they have in knowing the king, it doesn't show the light to those who are in darkness. But if they stand fast and rejoice that they're persecuted just for knowing Jesus and doing what's right, they shine that light. See, these attitudes and behaviors characterize people who have repented and believed the gospel of Jesus. Do they characterize you? These attitudes and behaviors are hallmarks of genuine disciples of Christ. Are these hallmarks of your life? These attitudes and behaviors identify citizens of God's kingdom who are eternally blessed. Are you more identified by your citizenship in America or by your citizenship in heaven? If we looked at your life, what do we see? This is the spiritual soil that Jesus cultivated in the hearts of his first followers, his disciples. And from these good seeds, Jesus would produce righteous deeds. And I'm not gonna share with you all the commands he gave them, but you can surely read this beautiful sermon from Matthew 5 to 7. Jesus' disciples, well, Jesus' discipleship with his disciples began in their hearts. He expected them to get to the root of the issue, to let him get to the root of the issue in their hearts. Obey his commands from the heart and teach others to obey his commands from the heart. Hear his voice in Matthew 5 and verse 19. He said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, He called them to obey from the heart and teach others to obey. Remember that first call, follow me, obedience from the heart of a repentant disciple, trusting Jesus. I will make you fishers of men. I will give you the ability to call others to that repentance, to that faith in me, to that life of obedience from the heart. If they would follow him, he would prepare them to teach others to follow him. An important thing to realize, he did not call them to follow him in isolation. He did not call them to follow him in isolation. Go forward to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, we find the disciples are not following Jesus well. He taught them, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Right? He taught them, blessed are the meek. 
Well, they had a question for Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. Look what they asked. They said, they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They have made application of Jesus' teaching. It doesn't sound very poor in spirit or meek. It doesn't sound like they were hungering or thirsting after righteousness or being pure in heart or being peacemakers. It sounds like their hearts were hungry for greatness. You cannot thirst for greatness and follow the great king, Jesus, at the same time. If you aspire for greatness among others, you isolate from them. Jesus did not call his disciples to follow him in isolation. He called them to humble themselves like little children and receive each other as fellow children of God. He commanded humility that would lead to community. Look at, chapter, or look at verse two. After this question, Jesus called a little child unto him, set him in the midst of them, and he said, verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted, become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man was converted, humbly received Christ as king with the simple faith, of a little child, he would not enter the kingdom of heaven. That humility that was necessary for the life of the disciple to begin, right? When he was converted, it was necessary for his life on his journey to heaven. Look at verse four. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, if everyone's humbling themselves and seeing themselves as a little child, kind of insignificant in influence, right? <laughs> and power and might and wisdom. I'm just, I'm, I'm a child, you're the ancient. If everyone humbles himself like that, then no one's great. Oh. That hu humility was necessary for the community. Look at verse five. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, so here's someone who humbles himself as a little child and they receive someone who's humbled himself as a little child. Whoso receives one such little child in my name receiveth who? Me. So if a man received Jesus as his king, he would learn to receive the king's people as his people. And Jesus took sin against his people seriously. Look at verse six. But whoso shall offend or cause to stumble one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus takes sin seriously. Verse seven, woe unto the world because of offenses or sins causing others to stumble. It must needs be that offenses come. It happens in this evil world. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. You are personally responsible for your sin. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. Cast them from thee. Now, again, Jesus is using a very vivid picture. If all of us applied this literally, we'd all be walking, we'd have a church full of this going on. Because all of us sin. The point is take radical action if your foot offend thee, cut a hand or foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, following Jesus into life, halt or maimed, than. I'm losing my place here. Rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast in everlasting fire. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast in hell fire. I already said, if a man received Jesus as his king, he would learn to receive the king's people as his people. And sin was a grave risk to the king's people. See, churches... And disciples who advocate, come to Jesus, he loves you as you are. That is true, but if they leave it there, it's a half truth. Because Jesus intends to save sinners that come to him as they are. And transform their lives from the inside out. So that they take seriously their sin and learn to deal with it. See, the disciple would learn to amputate sin from his life. So he did not cause the king's people to stumble. What if one of the king's people stumbled? What if one of his professing disciples sinned? What should a disciple's attitude be toward a sinning and a stumbling disciple? Well, Jesus taught his disciples, verse 10, take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. Don't despise them. <laughs> I would never do that. No, don't have that attitude. Why? For I say unto you that in heaven their angels 
do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. They are of interest in heaven. Also, verse 11, for the son of man, Jesus is come to save that which was lost. How think you, what are you thinking? He gives an illustration of a shepherd and a sheep. If a man, he has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray. Doesn't the shepherd leave the 90 and nine and, and go into the mountains and seek for that which has gone astray? And if he, if he finds it, verily I say unto you, Jesus said, he rejoiceth more of that sheep that went astray than of the 90 and nine, which went not astray. Even so, verse 14, it's not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. So you ask, what should a disciple's attitude be toward a sinning and stumbling disciple? Well, what is God the Father's attitude toward a sinning and stumbling disciple? What is the son's attitude toward a sinning and stumbling disciple? I heard the illustration recently of first responders Imagine there's an emergency, there's an accident and 911 is called and here come the EMTs, here come the firefighters. If these EMTs are firefighters who are called to an emergency, when they come, if they come and they started criticizing the person and condemning the person, how could you do this? They would not be there to rescue the person. They don't come to criticize the person who's in peril. No, they arrive ready, trained, equipped to rescue the person in need. Jesus did not come to earth to criticize or condemn. He came to rescue sinners in need. He came to expose the fact that they're in the dark and they are sinners in need. And he came to rescue them from their sin if they will turn to him. He came to save the lost like a good shepherd. Jesus is there. And he came to pursue lost sheep. It's not the father's will to lose one of Jesus' disciples. That was Jesus' attitude and consequent action towards sinning and stumbling disciples. That's the Father's attitude, consequent action towards sinful disciples. And Jesus instructed his disciples to make his attitude their attitude and consequent action. In fact, he outlined the action they should take to pursue a sinning and stumbling disciple. Look at verse 15. He said, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Have a frank honest, confrontational conversation. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Get all the facts straight. And they call him to repent and submit to Christ. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the And to who? The church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So confrontation was a daily part of discipleship. A majority of church discipline would happen in the rhythm of life when one of these Christ followers sinned against another one. A majority of church discipline happens right there. Rather than fighting about things, they were called to be peacemakers as children of the king. And if, if one disciple made an effort to make peace with another disciple, if that brother refused to repent of his sins or resisted that reconciliation after those disciples made these humble and loving attempts to make peace, the matter would be brought before the church. And if this sinning and stumbling disciple refused his church's loving attempts of reconciliation, they had the authority and responsibility from Jesus to identify him as a man who never repented and believed King Jesus. The church would say, we're not going to say you're going to hell, but we cannot say that you are going to heaven based upon your life. He gave them this authority to act in love. Look at verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye, plural, speaking of the church, shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, you make a decision to to remove someone from you, from your membership, 
because they refuse to repent of sin against Christ, against his people, against the witness of the gospel. You have the authority to remove them. Verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus gave his church this authority to act in love, to reconcile sinners who claimed to be citizens of heaven. He gave them this authority to get the attention of professing Christians who would not repent of sin. He expected them to use this authority as a church to call unrepentant sinners to repentance and faith in him. Now, let me ask you, majority of churches in the landscape today, are most churches serious about obeying Jesus in Matthew 18? No. They open the front door and they shut the back door, meaning do whatever you can to get them in and do whatever you can to keep them in rather than making it difficult to get in. Why should it be difficult to get in? For the same reason that Jesus said, if a man's not willing to take up his cross, if a man's not willing to hate his father or mother or sister or brother and follow me, he's not worthy to be my disciple. We welcome people here to hear the gospel. We welcome people here to to hear how they can be saved from their sin. But if they're not willing to humbly repent and believe the gospel and submit to the authority of Christ's body, they don't belong here. Welcome to attend. Welcome to hear the word of God, of course. But they must submit to Christ. They must submit to his people. See, the chief shepherd built his church by teaching his apostles how to cultivate a healthy church. A healthy church is a holy church. A healthy church is a humble church. A healthy church is a loving church. A healthy church is an obedient church. A healthy church is a group of disciples who confronts sin to restore each other to obedience as disciples. Jesus taught his disciples to be healthy disciples. He taught his disciples to be a healthy church. And if his disciples obeyed these commands together, they could teach others to obey these commands together. They had to live out this humility and receive each other. They had to live out this holiness and remove their sin. They had to live out this love and pursue each other even when they were in sin. I don't want to get messy in their problems. You're called to love them back to Christ. You're called to come along beside them. They had to willingly confront sin and forgive sinners. They had to do the difficult work of discipleship. This is discipleship. They had to lead by example together. And this was a struggle for the apostles. You remember their question that prompted this whole teaching in Matthew 18? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, that question was still on their minds in Matthew 20. Go forward to Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. See, the disciples, the apostles, they had selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. Wait a minute, does that sound familiar? James confronted ambitious brethren in James 3 for the condition of their hearts. And what was in their hearts? Bitter envy, jealousy. I wish I could. ah, ah. What else was in their hearts? Strife, this selfish ambition, this politicking, this I'm going on a campaign in the church so I can have prominence and influence. In Matthew 20, Jesus' disciples had all of that in their hearts. Look at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Talk about ambition. Talk about politicking. Talk about enlisting your mama in your campaign to be one of the greats in Jesus' kingdom. That never happens in his churches. What did the rest of the disciples think about this? Look at verse 20. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. That means, yeah, we'd like you guys to be in charge of us. No, they were mad. They were angry. They were jealous. Talk about bitter envying and jealousy. This feels like James chapter 3, doesn't it? Where did James get these ideas? 
These were Jesus' first disciples. These were the apostles. And Jesus had better set them straight, huh? Unless they make disciples who repeat all this stuff. And he did set them straight. Look at verse 25. He called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But among Jesus' disciples, his church, greatness is not determined the same way as it is in the world. See, the kings of the nations, they dominate people. Even in a land where we have a representative government, a democratic republic, where it should be governed of the people, by the people, for the people. The people that get in office end up doing what? They dominate. They become selfish. It's human nature. The kings of this earth control the lives of the peons. Look what Jesus said, verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, he rebuked. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. The word minister is diakonos. Interestingly enough, this is the same word used for the word deacon. It means a person who attends to the needs of another. Picture a waiter who's running errands for someone, right? I'll fill up your glass, I'll do this or that. It's someone who waits on the needs of others. See, the sons of Zebedee, they wanted to be great among the disciples so they could exercise authority. But Jesus told them, if you desire greatness among my disciples, learn how to minister to their needs. Verse 27, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You desire greatness, learn how to be a, the literal word is slave. Rather than seeing fellow disciples as stepping stones or rungs on a ladder of spiritual success. And when you've reached the top, man, you've got it and you have authority and they are your slaves. See them as brothers. You are called to serve. In fact, Jesus or Paul would call himself a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. Just a slave to obey the commands of his Lord. And why would the disciples be called to this? Why? The king, Christ Jesus, came to serve, verse 28. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Following Jesus means denying self. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself. You must die. Take up your cross, that instrument of torture and execution, Lay down your life and serve his people. Interesting fact, Paul told Timothy that one of the qualifications for someone to be an overseer in the church is that they would rule well their own house. Not rule, these kids are my slaves, but rule, lead their house like Jesus, laying down their life. And what is parenting? But laying down your life for the needs of another for a long time. How could Jesus' disciples love their Savior apart from laying down their life for the people he saved? Wasn't Jesus calling them to wisdom from above? Wasn't he commanding practical humility? A disciple could only follow Jesus by putting the needs of others, particularly the spiritual needs of others, in front of his own needs And in place of his own ambition. Jesus' disciples had worldly desires for greatness. And Jesus said, replace those desires. Put the needs of others first. The spiritual needs. Remember Jesus and Peter in John chapter 21. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Put the needs of my sheep, my people in front of your own. See, his disciples learned these attitudes somewhere. The religious leaders of the day, the scribes and Pharisees, were all about self. Go forward to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus confronted the scribes and Pharisees for using their position to weigh down the lives of God's people and lift themselves in the eyes of men. He exposed them publicly. Look at verse 4. He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, they bind heavy burdens and grievous or difficult 
to be born and they lay those burdens on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In other words, you live this, 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 there, here, live it. Oh, I can't do it. And they don't even live up to the standards that they ascribe for somebody else. And why, why do they do what they do? Verse five, all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets to be called a men, rabbi, rabbi. They weigh down the lives of others to lift themselves up in the eyes of men. But Jesus did not want his disciples to be like them. Look at verse eight. But be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master even Christ, and all ye are brethren, and call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven, neither be ye called masters. For one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself, shall lift himself, shall be abased or brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. What Jesus taught his disciples about leadership titles here reminds me of what Bishop David said last week. He said, they call me bishop over there in Africa, but you can call me whatever. I'm not about titles as much as I'm about the task. Jesus tasked his disciples to be brothers who love each other, who pursue each other, who call each other to follow Christ. He tasked them to follow him and fish for men. He tasked them to humbly serve people. And after Jesus ministered and gave his life a ransom for many, he rose again and he commissioned them. Go forward in your Bible to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. In verse 18, he claimed to be Lord of all. He came and spake unto them in the mountain uh, with the 11 there, the 11 apostles saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's Lord, he's king, he's master, he's the head. He's the chief. All authority and power belongs to Jesus everywhere. He then commissioned them, verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're under my authority. My authority under, extends over everybody. So I'm calling you to go, to call people to repent and submit to my authority as Lord, as King, as Savior. Baptize them, verse 20, teach them to observe. All things whatsoever I've commanded you. Don't just teach them information. Teach them how to obey me from the heart. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. See, Jesus' first disciples followed him. And now they would fish for men. They would teach men and women from all nations the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would baptize new disciples under the authority of Jesus and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they would teach those new disciples to obey Jesus. And what else would that obedience look like but the attitudes and the behaviors Jesus taught them to have in the Sermon on the Mount? What else would that obedience look like but the righteous fruit produced from the roots in their hearts? As they repented and followed Christ. What else would that obedience look like? Hey, learn to obey Jesus in this way. Uh, What would that look like but the humility and the community that Jesus expected the church to practice as it confronted, loved, and forgave repentant sinners? What else would that obedience look like but the leaders of the church serving one another and serving the church as brothers, as equals? When Jesus began discipling his apostles, he committed to three and a half years of patiently teaching rascals. When when pastors commit to lead a church, they commit themselves to a lifestyle of discipling rascals, them included. Jesus made these men fishers of men by preparing their hearts for humble service of his church. And when the time came and Jesus returned to heaven, The apostles led the church at Jerusalem Christ's way. Go forward in your Bibles to Acts 1. Acts 1. Look at 
Let's see if we find the apostles fighting for power now that the chief shepherd was off the scene. Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Let's see if they're fighting for power. What are they doing? Acts 1 and verse 13. When they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. And these all continued with argument to establish who would be the chief leader among them. No. These all continued with one accord in harmony and unity in prayer and supplication with the women in Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, with the church. Hmm, they were not fighting for power. They were praying together for power. And they were also obeying the scriptures together. Look at verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. So there's about 120 people in the church of Jerusalem. And Peter gets up and he says, hey, men and brethren, this scripture, he draws their attention to the word of God. He says, this scripture, this Old Testament scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. In other words, Judas, this 12th apostle who betrayed Jesus, the scripture spoke to this issue that's relevant in our life. And this is what he said. He said that uh, that he was to be replaced, basically, if you look in the verses going forward there. That he would be replaced. And so in verse 21, note, he said, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us. uh, Let's think about all these men who've been with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Think about all these disciples. Go back to the baptism of John, verse 22. Who has been with us from the beginning under that same day? He was a person who was with us from the baptism of John all the way to the day that Jesus went back to heaven and he ascended. Think about a man that can be ordained with us to be a witness of his resurrection. A 12th apostle. And let's appoint that man. And so, verse 23, they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they brought these two before the Lord, and they prayed, and they said, basically, Lord, which one do you want us to select? And they ended up selecting Matthias in verse 26. The scriptures guided them to replace Jesus, to replace Judas. And rather than think, well, one less apostle to worry about in the struggle for power and preeminence, They said, the scriptures indicate we need to replace Judas and fill this office. And they did. And wisely and prayerfully, they selected Matthias to be numbered with the 11 apostles. And the new 12, if you would, led the church at Jerusalem Christ's way. They were not fighting for power. They were praying for power. They were submitting to the scriptures together. Christ gave them his power through the Holy Spirit to preach his word and teach thousands. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, with all, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, the Holy Ghost came upon them as they were together and following Christ together. He sparked, the, the Holy Ghost sparked the interest of thousands in Jerusalem and power of the twelve to proclaim the wonderful works of God. And Peter stood up among them and preached that phenomenal gospel message that ended in verse 36. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. They preached the gospel and what was the result? Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. These people who believed the gospel were born again, were baptized, were added to the church. About 3,000 of them were added and what did they do? Verse 42, they continued They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. They continued in all these things. The church in Jerusalem continued together. The apostles taught them. The church was in fellowship. The church prayed together. The church met each other's needs. The church worshiped together. The church ate together. The church impacted Jerusalem together. The church at Jerusalem was together. Where did they learn their togetherness from? But the leaders that the Holy Ghost appointed over them in the 12. 
The apostles led the church at Jerusalem Christ's way, and the church at Jerusalem grew by thousands. With each new obstacle that reared its ugly head, the apostles together led the church past the obstacle Christ's way. And what did they do but disciple the future leaders of the church at Jerusalem in Christ's way? The apostles would not be around forever, and they are not around. The church would continue on earth post apostles. They had to make future leaders of the church. They had to commit the things they learned from Jesus to faithful men who would teach others also. And because your mind is only as good as your behind, I'm going to stop. I'll give you the blanks for number two and number three. And you check this out yourself, Acts 15 and Acts 21. The apostles led the church at Jerusalem until they were succeeded by James and the elders. The apostles led the church together in this humility, in, in this humility guiding this community until James and the elders were replaced or replaced those men. The Holy Ghost replaced the apostles and their leadership with men called elders. It's interchangeable with pastors, bishops. Look at Acts chapter 15, in your own time, Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 21. We're not getting into the specifics of all that, obviously. And then number three, James taught the church to appoint teachers who live by wisdom from above. So what is the point? Jesus taught 12 men to lead his church together in humility, to lead his church ultimately to have authority over them. Because if one of these men sinned, who had the ultimate authority to remove an apostle from office? The church did. And these apostles taught their replacements that they're called elders, and we're going to unpack it next week. He taught their replacements how to lead his church this way. When you get to James chapter 3, this is why it makes sense that James expected if men wanted to be teachers to lead with wisdom from above, lead with this humility, this purity, this peacemaking spirit, this planting of the seeds of righteousness in the good soil of the hearts of his people. This is how God has done it. Now think about this, the Wizard of Oz. Do you remember the yellow brick road? Follow the yellow. On the Wizard of Oz, old Dorothy was off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And as long as she followed the yellow brick road, she would find the wizard so she, should, she could get back to Kansas. And in many churches, we're not in Kansas anymore, meaning we have gotten away from God's plan of leadership. The Holy Spirit ordained elders, pastors in every church. And we're not there anymore, are we? Many churches are dominated by one man. Many churches are led by one man. Are we going to follow the yellow brick road? If we follow the chief shepherd's yellow brick road of humility and service, we can appoint pastors in his church to lead with wisdom from above. 